Okay, well, I want to welcome everyone to another beautiful Sunday service at Christ Reformed Church. And I'm Pastor Ferguson, you all know me. Uh, we have the honor and the privilege to come together and not only worship the Lord as a corporate body together, uh, but we learn uh, about the Lord, don't we? And we learn about His Word. And that is what makes us grow in Christ, is what you know. If you don't know anything, you're not going to be growing, are you? Right. You've got, you got to have knowledge in order to become like Christ. You have to know uh, the Word of God. This book right here has the power to transform you into the image of Christ, does it not? Amen. 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 It's a very powerful book, the most powerful book in the entire world right here. And you open it up and it will change you. And if it doesn't, well, and this, you're going to be worse than you were before. Because <laughs> you've heard the truth and then you've rejected it. And now you're worse. Now you would have been better not opening the book at all. That's what the Bible says. So, at any rate, uh, we got a good service for today. Back in Galatians uh, chapter 5, verse 2. And before we do, we're going to go to God in a word of prayer. We're going to ask Him for His hand of blessing and healing upon us. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The name above every other name, the name that we love and adore. But not just the name, it's the person behind the name. Uh, namely you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, we bow down before you, we are seeking your guidance, your instruction, your wisdom, your counsel. Uh, your leading hand, uh, blessed Lord, uh, it is our desire to be made like you. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you will continue to make us, mold us, and shape us into the image of Christ, our Lord. Father, we thank you for choosing us before the foundations of the world and placing us in Christ. And you've given us everlasting life in Christ, and you have spared us from everlasting torment in hell. And we are forever grateful unto you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We bring before you our bodies, those of us that are struggling with weakness, Brother Leroy and his burning sensation, and Brother Herbert and his leg, and his uh, immune system, and Brother Tom and his, uh, his legs and his uh, ability uh, to move and whatnot, and John, we pray for him, you just calm his nerves, and help him not to worry about uh, other people or the things of this world. We thank you, praise you, and love you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We ask you to bless this service by reading and our hearing, understanding, and application of your most holy and righteous word. We pray for all who are in authority above us. You bless them, our president, and all in his administration, with wisdom and good counsel. We pray for their salvation as well. And we pray for the members of this facility. Lord, for their salvation, we pray, and God, that everybody may dwell together peaceably, that you would use these great men uh, for your gospel, that they will be willing to share your gospel with these members of this facility. And Lord, we pray for the workers and nurses and doctors and helpers. And God, we just pray that you might change them uh, into the image of Christ as well. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love you, of those who have been called according to your purposes, that we may be conformed 
into the image of Christ, to whom we turn our attention in this hour, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're back in the book of Galatians. I was reading in my study uh, this morning and um, come to find that the uh, uh, Tower of Babel or Babel, some people say uh, the Tower of Babel, and some say Babel, but I kind of like the Babel because it says God confused their tongues and everybody was babbling. <laughs> so that's why I call it the Tower of Babel, right? At any rate, this, uh, this great tower uh, was built uh, by an ungodly man. And uh, Nimrod, and he was uh, trying to lead the people astray by building this pagan uh, temple and idol. And but God would not have it, and He confused them, didn't He? <laughs> that they were trying to build this this great edifice, uh, reaching up, you know, unto the gods. They, they were trying to work their way into heaven, so to speak. Aren't they? Say, why was it so tall and so big? Well, that's what man does. He tries to uh, work his way into heaven. But that's a foolish attempt, isn't it? Because the Bible clearly says that by the works of the law, by the way, they weren't working by the law, they were just building a building. But the Bible says, even if you try to work your way into heaven by keeping uh, the law, uh, you will not uh, get in. No. The law is too great and too holy. And your little stone edifice that uh, uh, he built uh, was not even going to get close to coming <laughs> into God's kingdom. God's kingdom is not made with physical hands. Uh, but God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, isn't it? It is spiritual. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Now that's wonderful. That says you've got a treasure, Brother John. A treasure inside your soul. That Jesus lives there. And Jesus has hid all the riches and fullness of heaven. He is heaven, isn't he? Yes. If you look at, at Jesus, you're looking at heaven. Right? And he's the one that made heaven. He is heaven. He's so beautiful. At any rate, uh, man has always been trying to build things and do things his own way. But God... Uh, confounds man and God is building other things, isn't he? God is building things not seen with physical eyes. God is building uh, invisible uh, temples and, 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 and kingdoms, so to speak. He's working in us and he is making us into the image of Christ. So let us turn our attention now to this chapter 5 of Galatia. Chapter 1, or verse 1 says, and we covered this last week, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now we talked about that at a pretty good length uh, last time. And describing now that uh, we're not to go back to the uh, rules and regulations that we once thought we were able to uh, keep that would get us in good favor with God. The traditions of men. Now the Jews had a lot of traditions, didn't they? They were heavy on tradition. 
they said to Jesus and his disciples, they said, now, why, why do your disciples not, uh, you and your disciples don't wash your hands before you eat? They said, That's a, uh, that is breaking the tradition. Because us Pharisees, we make sure we're nice and clean. And Jesus answered and says, uh, you think you're clean, but you're not. <laughs> your, your hands might be clean, but your heart is filthy. Amen? Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing. Jesus uh, did say that in effect, but what he actually said is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, it's what comes out. Right? And he wasn't talking about vomit. He was talking about the words that proceed from your mouth. That's coming from your heart, isn't it? If you're angry, then the words that come out of your mouth are not going to be very pleasant, are they? You know, at least they're, they're, they're going to be uh, soil. You know, if you, speak, if you speak bad words to somebody, that means you've got ill favor in your heart. You have hatred in your heart. And God commands us not to have hatred in our hearts. But we are to forgive. Jesus said, if you don't forgive your neighbor of his sin against you, then your Father in heaven will not forgive you. So that's some serious business, isn't it? That means you have to forgive. No matter what they did to you, you've got to find it in your heart to forgive them. Okay? Because that is what God has done to us. So let's look at verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Okay? So the Jews were coming around to the Gentiles, these Galatians. Galatia was a Gentile region. Over there by uh, Philippian, over there by, uh, it's in that region of Asia Minor. Okay? Kind of in between Italy and uh, Jerusalem, that section over there. Today it's like Turkey and uh, like Istanbul is the capital and places over uh, in that region. At any rate, Paul says, now if you go ahead and if you, if you think circumcision is going to win you favor, because the Gentiles were not circumcised, were they? No. They didn't care about no sir. They didn't know what circumcision was. <laughs> and, well, you're going to do that. No, no, no. No, I, <laughs> I don't think we need to be doing that. That sounds pretty painful. Well, the right of circumcision was given to Abraham, wasn't it? When Abraham, you know, Abraham was uh, 90, uh, what was he? He was in his 90s when that right was given unto him. Uh, I believe it was 99. Yes, 99. He was just shy of 100. And uh, the same day that God commanded him to be circumcised, he did it. Same day. He had 99 years old and he had to get circumcised. And his son, Ishmael, was 13 years old and he had to get circumcised too. Okay, so that was a bloody day, uh, to say the least, but he was being obedient. The circumcision, of course, was, you say, what is this all about? The circumcision, why? Why, does God, why is God even commanding circumcision? Well, I'll tell you why. Because it is a sign of the putting off of the flesh. Literally, isn't it? It's taking a part of your flesh and it's putting it off. Right? And so, it's an outward sign of an inward working. Okay? So you're taking the flesh, you're saying, I'm cutting off a, a, a portion of my flesh it happened to be in a very private area. <laughs> that's the area 
uh, you know, not like God, God could have said, no, I want you to skin your hand or skin your elbow to circumcise your elbow, right? <laughs> or circumcise your, uh, your back or something, but no, God says you circumcise the private part, right? Because it's the heart that is private, isn't it? Just like you, uh, that uh, aspect of you is private, your heart is private. And so God is dealing, He wants you to be thinking about your heart being circumcised. <laughs> cutting off the old man, see? The flesh, the old man is represented by the flesh. He, he is the old man, okay? The old man is what constitutes the flesh. Okay? So when you have the flesh removed from you, then you to consider yourself a new man, aren't you? See, the Gentiles didn't have the right of circumcision because they didn't have the oracles of God. They couldn't be made new. They didn't have the they didn't have the word of God. They had philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Xenophon, and all these other Greeks, and Hippocrates, and, you know, they were, they were thinking about God, but they didn't know Jesus Christ. They didn't know about the Messiah. See, they had enough uh, earthly wisdom to know there must be one God, right? I read, I studied Socrates and Plato when I was in college, and uh, these were probably the, the, the most godly of the Gentiles that you would be able to come across, because they were really thinking about God. They said, there must be only one God, there can't be two gods, there has to only be one, because God by definition is in control of everything. Therefore, there's only one God. See, but we don't know what His name is. <laughs> That's when Paul came to the, the Philippi, the, the uh, book of Philippians, he said, you're worshiping a God that, that you, without a name. It, they, they had a, a stone inscribed to the God with no name. And the oh. unknown, the unknown God. And Paul says, I'm here to tell you who that God is. His name, Jesus Christ. Right? Amen. Once again, back to the text. Paul is saying that if you go out and you get circumcised, if you think circumcision is going to save you, Christ is of no profit to you. Right? You might as well forget about Christ if you think circumcision can make you right. Same for baptism. Okay? Baptism came after circumcision. The circumcision was the sign of the Old Testament. They didn't baptize in the Old Testament. They didn't baptize. John the Baptist was the first to institute water baptism for the Israelites, wasn't he? Yes. And so, baptism replaces circumcision for the Christian. We're told to be baptized. We're not told to be circumcised, are we? No. Not, we don't have, hold circumcision services in the church, do we? No. <laughs> At least not any of the ones that I know about. Maybe there are some out there that do it, but it's not scriptural. So, the same holds too. My point is... Now, if you think that baptism is going to save you, as many Christians do, or many so-called Christians, you're wrong. You're mistaken. Okay? Baptism is no different than circumcision in regards to it is an outward sign of an inward working. Understand? It's an outward sign of something that has already taken place in your heart. So what is baptism? Well, baptism is to signify uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of you with Christ. Okay? You say, well, I want to be saved. Okay, come on into the waters. I'm going to save you when I dunk you down into the water and lift you back up. Then you'll be saved. 
Well, that's a work of the flesh, isn't it? There's a chair back there, George. You can sit right next to uh, Tom back there. We just got started, so you're not missing anything. This is Johnny. Yeah, you and John. And George will protect you, John. All right. George is your friend. So we're talking to George about... Uh, and the Yes. We're talking about baptism and how it is uh, in relation to circumcision. So, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized, right? And then be baptized. So you don't get baptized first in order to get saved. You get saved first. Then you get baptized. Understand? Otherwise, salvation would be of works, wouldn't it? If it came through baptism, it'd be a work of the flesh. Hey, Simon the magician, boy, he would have if he if he knew that, he would have made all kinds of money. Hey, come get baptized and you can get saved and, and you can be healed and miracles would happen. Well, and Jesus said to the man who was paralyzed in the Gospel of John, he was laying on his bed for 38 years, he was, you would have think Jesus would have said, now go into the pool of, of, uh, uh, of Siloam there and go be baptized and, and you'll be saved. He didn't say that, did he? He said, get up and walk. And you're saved. I saved you. You believe that I am who I am? When he met him in the temple, he says, yes, Lord, I believe, right? I believe. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. Not by water, not by circumcision, not by the keeping of the commandments. It's not by anything other than the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's look at verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Uh oh. Well, well, Paul's digging a little deeper here, isn't he? He's saying, Do you think circumcision is going to get you right with God? Well, okay. But you're going to have to keep the whole law. And you're going to have to keep it perfectly. You're a debtor. You're in debt to the law. Right? Because that's what they were saying. If you go back into Judaism, Judaism is in debt to the law, aren't they? The Jews over there that, that reject Christ, they're still in, they are debtors to the law. They have no Savior to deliver them from the law. And they can go on the weeping, wailing wall. They can say their prayers a hundred times a day and put their little request in the, the, the east wall of Jerusalem, what they call it the wailing wall, you know, over there in the Jerusalem. And uh, that's not going to save them, is it? No. No, it won't save you. The only thing that will save you is when you believe that Jesus died for your sins. And then when you do that, your heart will be changed. If you really believe, if, if it's a work of God, you won't be the same. Okay? If you put a dirty garment in a washing machine, okay, and uh, the garment comes out and it's still dirty, Say something didn't work right. <laughs> right. No soap. Okay. You got to have soap to get the clothes clean, right? So you need to have the Holy Spirit come in and wash you up, right? It's the Holy Spirit who actually makes you alive in Christ. You know, I was reading just the other day, and maybe you did too. Back in Genesis chapter 1, where it says that God formed man from the ground. And He formed him. He made him into a man. He said, let us make man in our image. See, that's the plural. 
That's the Trinity speaking. If anybody says, no, God is only one, like the Islam, Islam says God is just you know, one God. He's not three persons. Well, you take them and you say, do you believe in the book of Genesis? And most of them will say, yeah. Yeah, we believe some of the Old Testament scriptures. They say, well, it says here, let us make man. <laughs> Doesn't it? And the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, they'll say, well, God is talking about him and his angels. No. No, the word is not him and his angels. The word is us. And the word, the Hebrew word is Elohim. And it's the plural word for God. Okay? Plural. Means more than one person. At any rate, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and God took the man, and it says he blew his spirit into the man's nostrils. And man became a living soul. Right? That's how it works. And, uh, and when you get born again, God does the same thing to you. See? Because we died in Adam, didn't we? We once were alive, but when Adam sinned, we died. So now we have to be resurrected, don't we? We need to be born again. God, the Holy Spirit, has to come and blow Himself into our souls, doesn't He? He's got to make us alive, because we were dead. I ask people, how long have you been a Christian? They say, all my life. I say, all your life? You mean you were born a Christian? Yes. Ever since I was a child, I've been a Christian. Well, how could that be? You were only born once. The Bible says you have to be born twice. You say, well, I don't know nothing about that. Well, the bottom line is you, don't, you ain't been born again. And you're not a Christian. That's the bottom line, isn't it? You say you're a Christian, but you're not. Because you've never been born again. You ask them, has your life ever been changed? Have you ever repented of your sin? Are you repenting of your sin today? And they say, repentance, what's that? That means going to the club and, and going back home when I've been drinking? Is that repenting? No. no. Does that mean uh, uh, having a one night stand and then waiting the whole week? I repent uh, Sunday evening because I've got to go to work Monday. And then I repent. I won't do it again until Friday night. Is that repentance? <laughs> That's, that is practicing sin, isn't it? That's practicing sin. You're repeating it over and over, and you love it. The only reason why you're not doing it every night of the week is because it'll interrupt your job. And that will make you broke, and then you can't have it. Then you won't be chasing the, uh, the money around. And you won't have any women because you won't have any money. Right? Well, you can't fool God. God is not mocked, is he? No. God sees your every turn. He, he, he sees your every thought, doesn't he, Brother Leroy? Yes, he's watching you. He's watching me. He's saying, is, Tom, is Brother Tom following me with his heart? Is Brother George, is he really seeking me? Is, or is he just plain church? We have to ask ourselves that, don't we? Yes, each one of us. I'm not just picking on you guys, just using your names as examples. You know, we have to think, Am I really seeking the Lord? Or am I just playing Christian? Yeah? You know, playing, they call it churchianity. <laughs> you ever heard that one? Churchianity? No. <laughs> Some people just play church, don't they? Oh, Sunday morning, honey. Better get the suit out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, what about the show? We're going to miss our favorite show, honey. Oh, just record it. We'll, we'll watch it after. we got to go make a make a show of ourselves. Did you wash the car last night, Joey? 
Uh, yes, Daddy. Good job, because we want that car to be looking really nice when we pull in that church parking lot. We want everybody to think we got it going on, and we got all kinds of money. Is that what it's about? Looking good? No. God don't care if your car is covered with mud when you pull in the church parking lot. He's looking at your heart, ain't he? Is your heart cleaned up? Now, if your heart's covered in mud, then you're in trouble. <laughs> You've got some confession to do, don't you? First John says, if we, if we sin, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But if you don't confess, you say, well, I confess. I confess to, to Father John. Or Father, I confess to the priest. Didn't that forgive me? The priest, he interceded for me. That's what the Catholic Church teaches. And you know what? I drive by Catholic Church uh, pretty frequently. And on, they have their mass on Saturday evenings right around 6 o'clock, 6, 6.30. You know, just before the party end starts. <laughs> Say, yeah, well, get your sins forgiven, you know. Get, get, we, we'll cover you. We'll give you enough grace. Now you can go party. And make sure you show up tomorrow morning and try, or at least try. And if you can't make it, send a check in the, in the mail to us. And we'll pray that God will forgive you of your sins. That is not true. But that's the team. Silly garbage like that. You can buy your sin. You can buy forgiveness. No, it doesn't work that way. And you cannot get your sins forgiven by confessing them to a priest, can you? No. He didn't die. He didn't die for your sins, did he? No. Well, to the priest, to a doctor, the doctor, the doctor, he was supposed to die. To a doctor, to a to the priest, like a psychiatrist or a medical doctor. I would talk about that after the service. I'll, I'll talk to you about that. But let me keep going here. Bottom line, just to answer your question in short, is there's no doctor on earth, there's no priest on earth who has the power to forgive you of your sins. And the Pope can, the Mary can. No one can except Jesus Christ himself. Amen. That's it. So, let's look here at the next verse. Christ, verse 4, is become of no effect unto you, whosoever, you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. Oh, man. <laughs> That is some serious words right there. Paul is really letting them have it, isn't he? He said, you, ye have fallen from grace. Uh-oh. And, and now you're in trouble. You see, what they have done, Paul, you know, he evangelized it. He started this church. And now all of a sudden, these, these, these uh, Galatians are getting pulled away from the gospel. And they're getting pulled back into Judaism. See, they're saying that uh, now you need to be circumcised and you need to go back to the law of Moses and you need to forget about Christ. And Paul is saying, look, if you go back to, to legalism, if you go back to the law, if you go back to... Uh, the traditions of men that you have no savior. Right? You're fallen from grace. I told you the gospel. I gave you the gospel. Right? You received it, but now you're going back to what I delivered you from. <laughs> like a dog going back to his vomit. See? Even a, an older dog will learn you don't do that. <laughs> Puppies don't know better. Puppies throw up and they go 
hey, that smells kind of good. And go back and start licking it. An hour or so later, hey, that made me sick. Uh, maybe I won't go back next time. Unless they get about a year or two old, they say, I ain't touching that stuff. Well, Paul here is saying to these Galatians that you cannot go back to the law. You have fallen from grace. Okay? These Jews, whoever they were, that were trying to pull these Galatians uh, into the law and back to the law were working against Christ. Verse 5. For we through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Not by the law, but by faith. Righteousness comes by faith. Amen? It doesn't come from uh, attempting to keep the law. It comes from faith. It comes from a relationship with Christ. That's where righteousness comes from. See? By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's what the Bible says. You need to abandon that boat. Get off of it. There's a lot of Christians, at least so-called Christians, run around thinking they can somehow earn their way into the kingdom of God. They can somehow earn the righteousness of God. It can't be earned. Why? Because all of your works are as a filthy rag in the sight of God. It's not good. Your garments are soiled and they can only be made clean, not by trying to wash them out uh, with your own hands. Like, you know, I was reading the book of Jonah. And it says that uh, when Jonah told the sailors the storm is because of me, he says, uh, they said, well, what do, we, what, what do we need to do? And John said, you need to throw me off this boat. <laughs> and they said, nah, we ain't doing that. Come on, grab the oars. Let's work harder. And it said they rowed the moor. But it says, God, he made the storm even stronger. <laughs> Let me just read this. I'm not going to read the whole book to you, but I, I have to share this, okay, with you. It says here that uh, Jonah, here we go. Okay, Jonah says, take me up, cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land. They said, we ain't throwing you overboard. That's murder. <laughs> We're getting this boat to land. Let's get going, guys. You know, work harder. But it, the scripture says, but they could not. See, they were trying to save the boat. And they were trying to save their lives by their own strength. Weren't they? See what I'm saying? You see where I'm going? They were working. Man, we can do this. We don't need to go by faith. Because it would have taken faith to throw Jonah off the boat, wouldn't it? Faith. Yeah. It says, but they could not, for the sea rocked. W-R-O-U-G-H-T. That means the sea got stronger. <laughs> if you try to work your way into heaven, God is going to crush you. Isn't it? You cannot do it. The, the storms of life will break you. And it says the sea was wrought and was tempestuous against them. It got more violent. The harder they rode to try to get that boat to land, the God just says, let's turn it up a little bit. Let's see if they can row out of this storm. I've told them what they need to do through my prophet Jonah, and they're disobeying me. I'm just going to turn it out a little bit more. I'm gonna, I, go ahead, John. I'm going to make this storm so strong, they ain't going to have no choice but to throw Jonah overboard. 
Because if they don't, they're going down. Right? Either you walk by faith or you get crushed by God. That's how it works. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they said a prayer before they picked up old Jonah. They said, Lord, we're sorry. We're, but we don't want to kill this man. But he's telling us this is the only way. They are pleading to God. Now, you know, Pontius Pilate, he kind of did the same thing, didn't he? He said, I don't find no fault in this man. Uh, you sure you want him to be crucified? Yes, we're sure. Crucify that man. He said, but uh, my wife had a bad dream and said, don't have anything to do with this man. You crucify him. That's what the Jews kept saying, was there? He said, but I can release him to it's the Passover. And, and I can give one. I can release one. They said, don't give us Jesus. Give us the murderer, Barabbas. We want the murderer. Now that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Let the murderer go and crucify the innocent man. Wow. Okay, so it says, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. <laughs> oh, I love that. Don't you love that? Once they got into the will of God, they surrendered over to the Lord. They gave the Lord what He wanted. The storm stopped. Right? And he came. <laughs> you say, when are the storms in my life going to stop? Well, physically they may continue on, but spiritually they will stop the moment you surrender your life to the Lord. Won't that? The Lord will come in and He'll say, Peace to your soul. Be still, won't you? The storm is in your head, isn't it? You say, I've been reading here a book by, uh, oh, uh, who was this? Uh, uh, John Owen. And, uh, you know, he talks about the, uh, the storms uh, being in your, uh, in, in your mind. You see, the, the, uh, that's where the battle is. Your, your mind, you have two natures as a Christian, your old nature and your new nature, and they're both trying to control your mind, aren't they? See, when they, when you, when they give in to your flesh, the old nature, then the old nature begins feeding the mind. It says, look at this, look at that, entertain this, say that, say that. And then the new man comes, he says, uh-uh, we ain't having that. Hey, 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 mind, get back over here, right? And it's a two-way street, okay? The mind feeds the nature, and the nature feeds the mind. You understand? If you're feeding your old nature, then your old nature is going to be feeding your mind with filth, isn't it? If you're feeding the new man the Word of God, and prayer, and godly books, and whatnot, then... And then the new man is going to feed your mind good things. Like Christ, isn't it? Peace. Be still. It says, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. <coughs> Say, where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? Is for Paul says, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Not by the works of the law. Not by trying to work things out yourself. Not by trying to get that boat to shore. <laughs> oh, I need a doctor. Doctor, help me. <laughs> I'm dying. Do you think God doesn't know? That's your, that's your dying. 
believe. God, God is called the great physician, isn't he? He knows what, what you're going through. You think God is ignorant? He is the great physician. He, he is the great physician. But you must walk by faith. It says of Asa, King Asa in the Old Testament, he, he had a disease in his feet. And we don't know what the disease was, but evidently, you know, it, it was pretty bad. Maybe he got gangrene or something like what you were about to experience. And uh, it says of King Asa that in the book of Kings that he, he, he sought the help of physicians, but he didn't seek the Lord. And, and consequently, he died shortly after that. You see, you, 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 and I'm not saying there's, there's anything wrong, you know, with, uh, when you need medication or something, but what I, you need to be, the most important thing is you need to be seeking the Lord first and foremost. Amen? You, you, your heart, your soul, the body's going to perish. Amen? And there's no point in trying to save the body. Now, we should do all that we can to preserve it, to protect it, but the bottom line is this physical temple is not going to inherit the kingdom of God, is it? Because it's flesh and blood. Right? Not like the Mormons teach and they say that king, we are the kingdom of God here on earth. You know, that. hang on, John. The Mormons, in fact, I had a couple uh, Mormons come to my door uh, just a few days ago, this last week. They came to my door. I looked to them. Oh, there they are. Yes, I've been waiting for you guys. I opened the door and said, hey, how are you guys doing? They like, looked at me like I was crazy. Like, well, we don't usually get welcome like that. We, he says, uh, yeah, I said, well, I really want to talk to you. They said, you do? I said, yes. And they said, oh, well, uh, we saw your sign. I have a sign on my house. It says, uh, Seek the Lord on a wooden board on my front porch. And then on the other side it says, study the Bible. They said, we saw your sign. And we, we seen you. One of them said, I, I see you found Jesus. I said, yes. <laughs> yes, I really want to talk to you. I said, but I got food on the stove. And I really did. I, had, I was cooking some eggs or something. And uh, I said, can you please come back tomorrow at this time? I said, yes. I said, great. And uh, they, they said, here, would you like a book of Mormon? I said, sure. I took their little book. As I knew that tomorrow I was going to give them <laughs> this book. I was going to give them one of my gospel tracts, right? They don't usually accept gospel tracts. But if you can explain to them the gospel, and then maybe write your name and number on the track, you're, 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 you're giving them your information. See? And then they have to take it. Hey, my name and number. You say you don't want my name and number? <laughs> well, it's on that. Can you write it on a different piece of paper? Can you come back the next thing, Pastor Unfortunately, they did not. Because uh, the last question to me was, have you ever been visited by witnesses before? And I says, uh, or by, by uh, yeah, I believe they called themselves witnesses. They weren't Jehovah's Witnesses, they are Mormons. But uh, uh, I says, yeah, but it's been a while. <laughs> I, I really need to talk to them again. I'm sure they got me on their black list. <laughs> Don't go to that man's house. <laughs> he, he will, he, he, he will uh, evangelize you. <laughs> he, he will show you. He'll, he'll tell you things that will make you leave the Mormon church. <laughs> At any rate, I pray for him. And uh, I did leave the gospel text. I left a little sign on my my front door, thinking maybe they'll come back the next day. And I said to my Mormon friends, I said, please take these. And I had an arrow pointing down. 
Now, I'm sorry I missed you. <laughs> well, those tracks just stuck on my door. I called them like, wow, they're still there. <laughs> they did never come back. Well, anyways, uh, maybe someday they will. But um, we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. That's what it says. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. By faith. Righteousness comes by faith. Amen? That's what saved Martin Luther, the great reformer. He was a Catholic priest. You know that? Luther. Yeah, he was doing everything in his power to try to earn the favor of God. And you know what Luther says? He says, he says when I'm doing my prayers and beating myself, I find in my heart that I hate God. He was being just utterly honest with himself. He says, he says, I'm not, I have no peace. This God is so demanding and so brutal and, and expects me to do this and do that. And that's what the church was teaching him. you got to walk up the sea. He walked up the a uh, 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 hundred stairs on his knees to his knees were bleeding uh, trying to earn the favor of God in St. Peter's Cathedral. He make the, they would make these long journeys you know from Germany uh, down into Italy through the winter time trying to earn the favor of God and some of them would die you know on the way in a minute they wouldn't make it but they would do that and, uh, and it reminds me of even of Islam and how they, they make this journey to Mecca. You know, everybody's required to do that once in their life, to go to Mecca, make this journey. You see, have you ever seen a, a Muslim on the side of the road? Sometimes you'll see them, they'll pull their car over, they'll get out of their car, and they'll, they'll find which way is east, and they'll start on their knees. It's like they're pointing towards Mecca to the east. And see, that, that's, that's, that's the works of the flesh. That ain't gaining any favor from God. You, you don't even know who God is. And you're out there on the side of the highway. You, you, you could get struck by a truck. Uh, I've seen them do that, literally. They literally pull off the road. I say, what's that man doing on the side of the highway? He's going to get killed. Well, Man tries everything he can, like the sailors in the book of Jonah. They tried to row. They tried to bring the boat to the land, but they couldn't do it. You can't save yourself, can you? Only God can save you. Only Christ can save you. We walk by faith. See, when you have a relationship with somebody... There has to be an element of faith, doesn't there? In order to have a relationship, you have to believe what that person is saying to you is they're being honest. The moment you find out they're, they're lying to you, guess what? The relationship is going to dissolve. It's going to be over. You, you know, there's no more faith. You say, I don't have faith in you. Why? Because you lied to me. Right? I can't trust you. Okay? Faith is, is about trust. You know, you hear all these songs on the radio, they always sing in the world. What's the country singers? Faith Underhill. You see a country singer or something? Faith Hill. Faith Hill. I, <laughs> I don't know what their names are. <laughs> but anyway, they always singing about uh, faith and, and, and love and, and things like this. But if you have faith in anything other than God when it comes to your soul salvation, if you are, have faith in, 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 in anything other than Jesus Christ, you ain't getting in to the kingdom, are you? No? Because you're saved by faith. And that eliminates all works, doesn't it? You say, Lord, I, I don't have any good works. Because your word has told me all my works are as a filthy rag. The book of uh, Isaiah. And the book of Romans says there's none righteous, no, not one. We are all unclean. There's none who comes close to the glory of God. We've all fallen short. Hang on. 
And so, verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. God is love. Amen. God is love. First John, let me read to you a little portion of Scripture that talks about love. Now, get this correct. Love is not God. That's what the world says, don't they? They say love is God. No. Love is not God. God is love. Amen? You can't reverse those two. Right? Okay. The world, they always sing about love. They treat love like love is God. Love is not God. God is love. Okay? Love comes from God, but love itself is not God. <clears throat> Here, first John. Uh, chapter 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Love. Okay? In this the children of God are manifest the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. That means you need to have love in your heart. That's it. We need to be loving and kind and forgiving. If you're not loving, Brother John, how will the world ever know about Jesus? They won't. They won't. Hang on. Hang on, John. I'm almost done. This is it. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith is working by God. You know, love, faith, Faith is a gift of God, isn't it? Faith. It says right there in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by faith through grace, for by grace through faith we are saved, and that the faith is not of your own, it's a gift of God. It's a gift. Some people get it, some people don't. We can't argue with God, can we? Why would I want to? I've been given the gift. Am I going to go around and say, Now, Lord, thank you for giving me the gift. But why don't you give the gift to this person? And as you know, some people say, if my, if my mom is not in heaven, then I don't want to be there. Or if my dad ain't in heaven, I don't want to be there. I mean, what kind of foolishness is that? It ain't for you. You ain't to decide. Who gives you the right to say who can and can't get into heaven? That's God's choosing, isn't it? Yep. See? I'm okay with it. And, you know, it would be great. So if I see some of my family members in heaven, praise the Lord. But if none of them are in there, I ain't going to be crying. I'm going to be praising God. Amen? I'm going to say, thank you. I'm going to be too consumed with the Lord and sitting down at the table with the Lord and looking in the, those those eyes of God. Saying, oh God, you, you have the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. <laughs> and I mean it. You know, some people say, now, Tom, you have beautiful blue eyes. And John, you have beautiful blue eyes. Or George, you have beautiful brown eyes. Or Zeebo, you got some, some beautiful blue eyes. Me and my eyes are like camouflage. <laughs> it's a passion. You got some beautiful camouflage eyes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've been in a war. <laughs> That's why my eyes are camouflaged. They're green and brown. Yeah, like, I guess they call it hazel. But, anyways, um, when you look at the eyes of the Lord, you're going to be so in love with Him. You, you ain't going to take your eyes off of Him. When you look in the face of God, imagine that. Staring in the face of God. Say, oh man, I finally, like Job said, 
In my flesh I shall see God. I, I shall see God. One day we're going to sit down and have a meal with God. That's something to look forward to, isn't it, Brother George? Oh, it ain't, ain't going to be no spangles uh, in heaven. It ain't going to be no KFC. No, this is going to be angelic food that we're going to eat. Oh, man. It's going to be a lot better than what you guys get here when I can make it home. i tell you that. But it's not the food. It's just going to be, we probably ain't going to be looking at the food. We, our eyes are going to be fixed on who? Jesus. Because he's God. I say, wow, I really sit down at the dinner table with God? <laughs> Is that, that really God? Yes. Everybody's eyes are going to be fixed on God. Say, man, look how beautiful God is. You ain't going to be worrying about your hair. Hey, do I look okay? No, you're going to be so enthralled with the face of God, you ain't going to be able to take your eyes off of it. I don't think there's going to be much eating going on. You're going to be eating like this. <laughs> Lord, you're so beautiful. Amen? I'm being serious. We've got something to look forward to. Not just a meal, but we're going to be spending all eternity with God. With Christ. Forever. And ever. And ever. And ever. And ever. Never, never going to stop. That's good news, isn't it? The grave, death has no power over us. None. No power. If we die before the Lord comes again, who are going to look in our fence at our grave and laugh? Say, <laughs> I beat, I beat death. Christ delivered me from death. You know, look at that. Look at that pathetic tombstone. Yeah. I ain't down there. I'm up here with the Lord. Amen? Okay, I'm going to stop right there in verse 6. Hang on, Brother John. We're going to say a prayer and I'm going to answer your question right after we pray, okay? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you for saving us sanctifying us, setting us free in Christ. We thank you for giving us everlasting life, Lord. One day we'll be able to sit down and dine with you. We'll be able to talk with you face to face and walk with you. Oh, Lord, we look forward to, to the day where we'll be with you, literally. But in the meantime, we're with you in spirit, and we walk by faith and not by sight. We thank you, O oh God, for giving us the gift of faith. May we never think that we can earn your favor, earn salvation by the works of the law. It can't be done. But may we get to know you better. May our relationship with you become more trustworthy. We thank you and praise you and love you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in thy name we pray, Lord. Amen. Okay. Yes. Yes.